Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, let's get started. Um, obviously, let's start by talking about uh, the deliverables. Uh, hopefully, most of you have successfully finished deliverable three. Looks good. Okay, I know not everybody has. There are some people that still have some installation issues. If you still have installation issues, please, please, please make sure to come see myself or the TA during our office hours. As you know, the deliverables are cumulative. You do not want to fall behind. If you cannot make our office hours, email myself or the TA. We will arrange to meet you outside of office hours and get you all caught up. Okay. Let's talk uh, a little bit this morning about deliverable four. So where are we going? Um, you probably figured this out by now. We're starting with the Leap Motion device itself, which is using its two infrared cameras to capture uh, infrared intensity at each pixel. So from the device's point of view, it has two continuously updating frames of data. But from the device's point of view, those frames of data are pixel values. There's a little bit of machine learning that is built into the device itself that takes those raw pixel values and <coughs> infers the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the tips and the bones of the major, uh, the tips and the bases of the major bones in your hand. You have been spending most of your time visualizing that data and at the end of deliverable three, you're writing this out in a NumPy, a NumPy matrix. So you're now able to capture the coordinates from the device and save out an arbitrary number uh, of frames, right? Okay. In deliverables four and five, we're gonna shift gears now away from visualizing the data, capturing the data, writing the data out to disk. We are now going to be developing a machine learning algorithm that takes the X, Y, and Z coordinates and tries to infer whether the user is signing the ASL gesture zero or one or two or three or four or so on or none of the above. So in deliverable four, we're going to focus on our machine learning algorithm for a moment. So in deliverable four, you don't need your leap motion device. You can put it away for a week. We're gonna be building the machine learning algorithm. In deliverable five, you're gonna be bringing back your data that you're capturing and checking that your machine learning algorithm is able to infer when you sign zero or one or two or three over the device. Yes, question. Google has a new API. They just released a new API that does a lot more than you just said. Can we use that? There's a Google API that does a lot more of what? There's a new machine learning algorithm for transition both front and back. Yep. And so you can now get, get like symbols like Yes. And it captures it through what? Not through the lead motion device. Uh, any, any image of a hand. So even if it's non colored, it okay. will infer from the stereoscopic infrared image to do the same work. And if it hasn't been done, maybe you can improve the process. I, I think that's a great idea. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of this course, tools come and go, but concepts are a little bit more permanent. If you choose to come back and take this course next fall, we will probably be doing it with the Google, Google's API through your webcam rather than the Leap Motion device. So you all are extremely lucky to probably be the last class that is using the Leap Motion device. Thank you very much for that. If you do want to try out the new Google API that does do hand recognition, when you get to the end of week 10 and you're developing your own final project, you're more than welcome to set aside everything we've done in the first 10 weeks and use that. No, no problem there. However, for the TA's sanity and my sanity and your sanity, we're all gonna do the same thing for the first 10 weeks. Sound like a plan? Okay, awesome. All right, so as you mentioned, the API does away with the, uh, Google's API does away with the Leap Motion device and it also uses some pretty high powered machine learning algorithms to do that. We are going to go in the opposite direction and use probably the weakest machine learning algorithm that's out there. Why are we using the weakest machine learning algorithm that's out there? It's incredibly simple, and I want you to be able to understand what's going on under the hood of your system, because obviously you're gonna to have to adapt 
your system for different users and different tasks in weeks 11 through 14. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the machine learning algorithm that comes with the device. You're responsible for getting this part to work. Okay. So I'm going to, before we dive back into the lecture material, uh, and before I talk about deliverable four, I want to talk a little bit about the K nearest neighbor algorithm, which as I mentioned is probably arguably the most simple machine learning algorithm out there. How many people have come across KNN before? Okay, less than half, that's great. All right, so we're gonna do a crash course in KNN. It is pretty simple. That's what you're gonna be developing in Deliverable 4. Before we talk about uh, Deliverable 4, I just wanted to make a note going back to Deliverable 3 for a moment. Uh, this was raised in class uh, on uh, last week and came up in office hours. This is a note about Deliverable 3. Uh, towards the end of Deliverable 3, it is not clear in steps 52 through 62 whether you're writing out to disk just X and Y or just X and Z. And it is also not specified in the Deliverable whether you are signing the digits with your palm facing towards the device or whether you're facing or you're signing with your palm up facing away from you. For deliverable three, we don't care. The only thing we care about is when you submit that second video that we can clearly see in that video the five ASL digits. That's the most important thing. I think the, it's three digits in the diamond. Uh, is, it the, is, it, is it specified just the first three? Yeah. Okay, whatever it is, the first three or first five, that's what the TA is looking at, right? Obviously, she does not have access to your code. So as long as what you submitted, you can see the hand clearly. If you follow the instructions to the letter of the law and you submitted a video in which we cannot see the ASL digits clearly, uh, send an email to me and I'll make a note to the TA about that. So there was a little bit of confusion towards the end of Deliverable 3 about that. I apologize. When we get to Deliverable 5, next week, you're going to be saving out all your data and sending it to the TA and she is going to be packaging it together. And as I've already mentioned, we want to make sure that all that data is in the same format. Deliverable 5 will be very specific about how you are meant to hold your hand when you sign the digits and whether we want just X and Y or whether we want X and Z. Question? Uh, it's going to actually be with the palm down. Why? Why are we gonna ask you to do palm down rather than palm away? Because it's a lot easier for the device when it's sitting on a flat surface Ex to see your, all your fingers. Exactly, right? So you've probably figured out by now the machine learning that comes with the Leap Motion device is not perfect. And it has a pretty difficult job because there's a lot of occlusion, right? The physical context about signing the ASL digits means that by necessity, some of the fingers are gonna be occluded by some others. Makes things differ difficult on the machine learning algorithm. We can kind of minimize that occlusion. We can make things easier on the leaps machine learning algorithm if we have palm down rather than palm away. Question. So we are breaking an assumption for those that do know ASL, which is the convention is palm away, right? Or palm towards the receiver. So we're gonna do things a little bit differently. Um, why don't we use three dimensional? We, we use only two. Uh, why, don't, why don't we use all three rather than all two? That is a great question. So obviously we're using all two, or only two for the drawing because we're drawing in 2D. Right. But when, machine learning when we do the machine learning, it, it doesn't matter, right? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. We're going to talk about K and N at the moment and why we may not want to use X, Y, and Z. Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on to uh, K and N. And before we talk about K and N, let's start this morning talking about flowers. Why are we talking about flowers? Well, in machine learning, one of the most famous data sets you'll come across is the iris data set and in, in deliverable four you're going to be developing your knn algorithm and testing it against 
not leap motion data, but against data that's been obtained from 150 iris flowers. Um, there's a, this very famous data set going back uh, to the early 30s, 40s, and 50s. These flowers were collected, 150 flowers were collected in a field, and those flowers corresponded to three different species of iris, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Now, if I were to color, cover up those labels, which is which? How would you know? Any botanists here? I'm not a botanist. Very difficult to look at these three photos and tell the difference between them. How does a botanist or an iris specialist know the difference between these three species? Experience. Experience, yes, absolutely. If we were to pick a random iris flower and give it to a botanist, obviously they would apply experience, but what have they learned through their experience with these flowers that allows them to classify them? They could do that. They could use a convolutional neural network, right, and apply the network to the flower. But how do you apply a network or an algorithm to the flower? What's the connecting tissue there? There's, there's the magic word, right? We're going to tr obviously try and classify these based on what they look like. And what do we mean by what they look like? We can extract from the flower features that describe the flower, right? So regardless of whether we're using a conv convolutional neural network, which is on the far end of complexity of machine learning algorithms, all the way down to a simple KNN, in order for a botanist or a machine learning algorithm to classify a flower, it has to quote unquote look at the flower and extract from that image or that picture certain features. And different species of flowers have different features. In the iris data set for these 150 flowers, it turns out that there are four features, uh, four major features that you can, that distinguish between different species. And we are now beyond my area of expertise. I don't know what those four features are. You can go and read about them on the Wikipedia page about the iris uh, data set, but they have to do with things about the length and the width of the petals and so on, right? We pull out those four features. We now have a data set that has 150 rows where each row corresponds to one of the 150 flowers. We have four columns that correspond to the four features that describe those uh, each flower. And then we have a fifth special column which contains an integer indicating zero if that flower was Setosa, one if it was Versicolor, and two if it was Virginica. Right? So not unlike what the leap motion is doing, we're taking our flowers, direct, uh, distilling them down into data, and we are now gonna try and push this data through a machine learning algorithm so that if we pick 151st flower, measure those four features and supply those four features to our KNN algorithm, it will give us back either the integer zero, one, or two, which will represent the learner's guess about which of the three classes that new flower belongs to. So far, so good? Okay, so how do we know whether our KNN algorithm is working well or not? Well, obviously we can give it a whole bunch of new flowers where we have hidden the actual species to which it belongs, look at the prediction that comes back from the learner, and compare them and see how accurate its predictions are. The other thing we can do, and what you're going to be doing in Deliverable 4, is actually visualizing the, visualize the workings of your KNN algorithm. In machine learning, you often hear the term black box, um, which is usually a negative term, meaning we may have an algorithm that, like a convolutional neural network, that does a very good job at making predictions, but we as the human observers don't know how it's making those predictions. One of the nice things about KNN is it is not black box. You can open the box and look inside and understand or visualize how it's making the guesses that it's making. And that's what we're gonna look at now. So in deliverable four, you're gonna start by visualizing the iris data set and then visualizing the predictions made by KNN. 
How are we going to do that? You're going to be using, fortunately or unfortunately for you, yet another uh, Python library called matplotlib. <coughs> matplotlib is used for scientific visualizations. Pygame is good for sort of animations and graphics. Matplotlib is good for scientific visualizations. So we're going to try and visualize the uh, flower data set. We know that there are 150 flowers, and each flower has four features that are predictive of the species to which it belongs. Unfortunately, the human visual system does not allow us to draw or represent pictures in four dimensions. So we're going to try and simplify things and draw things in two dimensions. To start with in deliverable four, we're going to take two of the features, feature one and feature two. And for each flower, we're going to throw away feature three and feature four. So we're already hobbling our KNN algorithm. It's going to be half blind. It's only going to see two of the four features. We can then plot in this figure any of the given 150 flowers with a point. And I'm going to represent uh, this point here as an S, representing we're plotting one of the flowers which belongs to the Setosa species. Remember that for every one of the 150 rows, we have that special integer 0, 1, or 2. So we know what species that flower belongs to. And we plot the position of that flower in this plot based on the value of its first feature and its second feature. We continue plotting a bunch more flowers that all belong to Setosa. And then we have Versicolor and Virginia. So we've got a couple of Versicolor here. And Virginica. Okay. I'm obviously not going to draw all 150, but in deliverable four, you will eventually have a picture that looks like this. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit today about visual design and we're going to do a little bit of visual design in deliverable four. We're going to try and represent all 150 flowers like this. What does the color represent here? Exactly, right? We're going to use the color to represent the species. Remember our discussion about Gapminder. We're going to try and use as little ink as possible to communicate as much information. Um, in this picture, we don't have all 150 flowers. There's actually only 75 flowers that are drawn here. Why are we only plotting the first half? Possibly. Exactly. So throughout deliverable four, we're going to introduce a little bit of terminology here, um, which was just mentioned. We're going to break our 150 flowers into two sets of 75 flowers. The first 75 flowers are going to be our training set, and as the name implies, they're going to be used to train our KNN algorithm. And we're then going to use the other 75 flowers as our test set, which we're going to use to test how well our KNN algorithm is working. Yeah? Okay. So we've got our 75 uh, training flowers drawn. You're then going to apply the KNN algorithm, which is to take the first uh, test flower, the first flower out of the second set of 75, and we know we know what the first and second values of the two features are for that flower, but we are not going to tell the KNN algorithm what species it belongs to, thus the question mark, and we're going to ask KNN to predict which of the three species that flower belongs to. For those that know the KNN algorithm, how does it do it? What's the magic step here? We've set up our algorithm. We have our training set. We're exposing it to a new test instance, a new test flower. How does it make? How does the KNN algorithm make its prediction? Uh, we assume that uh, the same species gather together. So the question mark is near to Virginia. It's a Virginia. Exactly. So the intuition behind the KNN algorithm, which is a pretty good assumption to make at the beginning, is I'm going to take this flower and ask among the 75 training flowers that I saw, 
which are the flowers that are most like the new flower? And I'll take the ones that are most like that flower. They are most similar in terms of F1 and F2, which in this picture corresponds to the training flowers that are literally close to the new flower. And I'll then guess, among those close flowers, whichever the most populous, uh, the most populous species is, that's my guess. That's the intuition under KNN, pretty straightforward, right? Flowers that have similar, similar length and width of petals or whatever these features correspond to, that's a pretty good indicator. So we're almost there, but we're missing one more detail. The KNN is going to guess based on the majority uh, species of its neighbors. Uh, that you're describing another algorithm. Okay. So the KNN algorithm is very, very simple. Very, very, very naive. Does it just average the location for each species? And then Does it average the location for, even spe for every species? Nope. Not even that. Just take its neighbors, and whichever species is most represented, the majority species, that's it. Yeah. Uh, it basically counts the uh, the neighbor around it. Count the uh, number of, yeah, count the neighbors around it. Yeah, which, which is the majority. Yeah. And which is the majority species is it. So we're missing one detail here. We're going to take the neighbors. Maybe how many neighbors? How many neighbors, right? So how many neighbors does this point have? We haven't defined what we mean by neighbor yet. So We've described the NN and KNN, right? Nearest neighbors. Oh, yeah. We're going to look at the nearest neighbors. We're going to specify, we have to give KNN one additional information, which is K, how many neighbors to look at. OK. Let's, for the moment, pick uh, K equals 5. So we're at this point, and we're going to look at the five nearest neighbors, which are these. What does KNN guess that this species belongs to, or this flower? VI, right? Virginicus or Virginia, whatever it is, right? VI, flower VI. That's the guess. OK. OK. How about this point here? What's the guess? It's not exactly clear. I haven't drawn this very clear. This is a neighbor, this is a neighbor, this is a neighbor, this is a neighbor. And Depends on how you define it. Depends. One of these, perhaps. Right? If it's this one, we have three VEs and two S's. So the prediction for this second test flower is VE and so on. Yes? What coordinate system does the KNN use? What coordinate system does the KNN use? You probably, you probably guessed the game by now. KNN is screamingly simple. What's the simplest distance metric we can use? What'd you learn in high school? Euclidean distance, right? Everything in KNN assumes the simplest version of everything. So since it's not taking any averages, could like one outlier really throw off the whole thing? Good question, right? What happens with an outlier? So uh, as you can see here, I've tried to draw this more or less what the actual distribution looks like for the first features. If we had an outlier, for example, let's say we put an S in our training set that was sitting in the middle of all the VI flowers, does S, the outlier, throw off the guesses of KNN? I get a question mark near, would it throw it off? If you had like a question mark near that S, would it throw it off? Let's see. Is KNN going to be thrown off by S? Not really, right? One of the nice things about KNN is it's simple. It's pretty robust to outliers. Not every outlier. You can construct a data set with a certain outlier that will throw it off. But generally speaking, KNN is pretty robust. So, you only two so far, we're only seeing two dimensions, right? As I mentioned, we've sort of hobbled. KNN, right? And we've tied one arm behind its back. Yes? Exactly. 
right? So if we were to plot, if we were to quote unquote plot all four features, we'd have a four dimensional space and we'd have 75 points that are floating in a four dimensional space. If we drop a new unseen flower from the test set into that four dimensional space, we would then use Euclidean distance in four dimensional space to find the five nearest neighbors and take the majority vote. Right? We just can't draw it, that's all. How do you determine um, what K is? Thank you very much. So next step, how do we determine what K is, right? So in this case, I've chosen a K equals five. How do we know what it should be? What are the bounds on K? What is the lowest value we could set it to and what is the maximum value we could set it to? One in the data set, right? So we could set k equal to 1 or k equal to 75. That's our range. Let's set k equal to 1 for a moment. What's the problem with setting it to k equals 1? That's when outliers start to be a problem. So if we have a, uh, if we have a flower that's sitting here, a test flower that's sitting here, and k is equal to 1, it's going to predict S, right? So K equals 1 is obviously not a good choice. What about K equals 75? Let's have a look at this picture over here. Here's all 75. If we set K equal to 75 and supply the 75 test flowers, what would K and N predict? Maybe have the most of every single time. Which you have the most of, which I think, well, I don't know what it is here. It's hard, hard to say, yeah? It will always guess the most common species, right? Which isn't actually a bad thing to do, but there's probably an intermediate value of k that's an easier choice. Is there a tiebreaker? A tiebreaker, right? So, good question. So, picking an even number for k, probably not a good thing to do in case you get half of one species and half of another in your, in your neighborhood, then you need to do some sort of tiebreaking. With an odd number, we don't we, ha we can get we don't have to do that. Well, not even then, because the I think the second question mark you put down it could have been two ves, two s's, uh, and yep. one vi. Yep. And then ah, uh, you're right. That's right. There is. You're right. You can still get. Thank you very much. It's too early in the morning. Yes. <laughs> so uh, yes, in K and N, there's probably a flip of a coin somewhere. Uh, you'll be working with a file. You'll be downloading a file for this called knn.py. You can have a look inside and see how it deals with tie, tie breaking. Yes. So I was wondering if it was like a, like a, you know, the average of the two that were S's versus the two that were B's, the digits total distance, like whatever the length total distance is. That would be a reasonable thing to do, right? To break the tie is to actually look at the Euclidean distance itself. Usually we throw that away, we only use it to determine neighborhood. Okay, so k equals 1 is a bad choice, k equals 75 is a bad choice. What do we pick? 7. 7, okay, <laughs> sounds good. If you don't know, you're in good company. So k is what's known as a hyperparameter. It is a knob that exists on KNN, and you can turn that knob or change that value of K, and it will influence how KNN behaves. We know that turning the knob all the way to 1 or all the way up to 75 is a bad choice, but it's not immediately clear what the value should be. In the assignment, um, you're given the value of K equals 15. Is that a good choice? It seems to work pretty well. You can turn that knob and see how well it alters the prediction accuracy on the 75 test flowers. The dirty little secret in AI and machine learning is all machine learning algorithms have hyperparameters, including conv convolutional neural networks. And no one knows how to set those hyperparameters in a principled manner. It is an open problem in machine learning and AI. So then how, doesn't that affect um, 
we call it not authenticity, but uh, reproducibility for things like papers and digital research. So does it affect reproducibility? If you write a paper and you do not describe your hyperparameters or how you chose them, then absolutely. It makes it very difficult to reproduce that work. Okay, this is not an AI course, so we're not gonna solve the hyperparameter problem uh, this morning. I just want you to be aware of some of these issues because they will matter. You're gonna have to turn the knob on KNN to get it to work well for your uh, data set. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, we're gonna use a visualization to see how your KNN algorithm is doing applied to the IRIS data set in deliverable form. Here's a visualization of two of the four features. Here is a similar visualization where I've taken the 75 training points and I've added the 75 test points. So we're looking now at, again, the two features. We've got 150 points. And I've tried to use some tricks from visual design to communicate how the KNN algorithm is doing. What is the visual trick that I'm using here, or you will be using, to communicate how well your KNN algorithm is doing? The black outline suggests a correct guess, so the lighter outline is going to be a correct guess. Possibly. So the black outlines, as you see, they exist for the training set. So in the training set, we don't have any prediction, right? We're just giving the actual species to KNN. So the black outlines are the training set, the ones without black uh, outlines are the test set. Yes? That's right. The ones without black are the test set. Um, you get some points that have two colors to them. You see some points that have two colors to them. What is that? Again, I haven't told you what it is, and I haven't written a block of text to describe. I'm hoping that my visualization is intuitive enough that you can figure it out on your own. Maybe like the inner color is the actual uh, species and the outer color is the guess or a version of that. Exactly. So we've got inner and outer colors to the points and it could be either hypothesis, right? Inner color represents actual species, outer color represents prediction or vice versa. I've tried to include in this visual design one further hint so I don't have to tell the observer which of those two it is. Exactly, right? So in the training set, which with the black outline, the inner color is the actual species that it belongs to, right? We talked last time about conceptual consistency. We're going from a training set to something else, adding the test set, and I'm hoping that you have built up an intuition about what the, how the training set is represented, and you assume that I'm gonna keep that that concept consistent when I start drawing the test points, right? It would be very frustrating if in the training set the inner color was actual species and in the test set the outer color was the actual species, right? If I told you that you'd be frustrated and you'd say that's a bad visualization, right? I've broken your expectations about how to read these plots. Yes? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so as we complicate, the, as we start to try different Ks, for example, we could, right, we could, add to this visualization KNN running with different values of K, for example? Is that what you're asking? Right. Yeah, in which case, maybe this, this new matter can like register colors very well in that one. Exactly, right? So if we added another 150 points, or another 75 points, we redrew the test points, but we colored them based on how KNN with K equals 30 was doing, how would we represent that? That's exactly what we're gonna talk about in lecture six in a few minutes, right? As we start to visualize more and more data, how do we communicate that complexity to the observer without overwhelming them? 
because after the algorithm makes a prediction, does it then add that prediction to its known area? So does that then affect the K of that area? Or is That's a great question. Separate? So once, once KNN makes a prediction about the first test flower, does it add its prediction to the training set? And should it? Anybody have an intuition? Would it help KNN if we added the prediction to the training set? Only if the target can properly identify it. Only if it actually knows whether its prediction is correct or not. And in the machine learning game, we're assuming we don't tell it. It just gives us the prediction, and it's done. We don't come back and say, your prediction was correct or not. If we do, then by definition, it becomes part of the training set. That's the meaning of those two terms. The test set, like a test that you take, right? It's done. You make your prediction, you write it down on the final exam, and you submit it, and you get your grade based on what you wrote down. That's it, right? You may get the graded test back. You may try and distill out of that what you got right and what you got wrong. The moment you do that, it becomes training data, right? You're using it, but it requires the instructor, the TA, to give you that additional information about whether your prediction was correct or not. We're gonna assume in this case that it doesn't. So far, so good? Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, we've been, look we've been trying to visualize KNN, and if you look at the colors on the test set here, hopefully, you can get a rough idea of how KNN is doing given a K of 50. How is, how is the algorithm doing in this case? And how do you know from the visualization? What are you looking for? Sorry? Points that got wrong. Yep, points that got wrong, which are? A little bit more than four. Not too many more than four. It does pretty well, right? So we're looking for the number of multicolored points, basically, right? With the exception of the black training points, right? So hopefully, if we've designed this uh, visualization correctly, it's relatively easy for, on you to visually inspect this picture and get a rough idea of how KNN is doing, right? As I mentioned, that's why we're going to all this effort in Deliverable 4, is to create a visualization where you can have a look and in the process of Deliverable 4, if you create a visualization and you see all 75 points are multicolored, <coughs> something's wrong, right? You can set k, equals, uh, k equal to 1, produce this picture, and you kind of know by now what you should see. You can then set k equal to 75, redraw the visualization, and before you see it flash up on the screen, if you followed everything so far about KNN, you should be able to guess what you're going to see on the screen, right? Okay. So, as I mentioned, we can't draw in four dimensions. What are you going to be submitting at the end of deliverable four? You're going to be you're going to be submitting this visualization again. Your KNN algorithm applied to the uh, Iris data set, but you're going to be visualizing features three and four, which are not shown here. Okay, so just a screenshot this week, no video, just you showing us your KNN algorithm, making predictions on the 75 test data, uh, test flowers using features three and four. So far, so good? Okay, uh, very quickly, what are we doing next week? Deliverable five, we are going to throw away the iris data set because we now have debugged our KNN algorithm and we're gonna plug in the data that you've been capturing from the leap motion device. So in the case of the flowers, we're submitting features that describe the flowers and it's outputting, in, KNN is outputting an integer, which of the species it believes the flower is. In deliverable five, you're gonna be grabbing a frame of gesture data, feeding it to KNN, and KNN is gonna be, again, giving you back an integer, which represents a prediction. What's the prediction? which of the 10 digits you're being signed, right? You're gonna, your KNN algorithm is gonna give you back a digit between zero and nine inclusive, which is its guess about which of the 10 digits the user is signing. It's gonna be a little challenging in deliverable five because we don't have four features anymore. How many features do we have? Potentially 
Not three, not two. Heading in the other direction, actually. And base. Yep. For all the bones and all the fingers, right? From one frame of data, which is how many features? 120 features, right? Luckily, we're not going to ask you to draw 120 dimensional visualization. As far as I know, no one knows how to do that. We're going to carry on in deliverable five and forward without the support of a visualization. So it's important in deliverable four to debug your algorithm, make sure it's working with different numbers of features, uh, different values of K, because you're going to tune those knobs later. One thing that we're going to do in deliverable five, and this is circling all the way back to original question this morning, which is X and Y or X and Z, we have 120 <coughs> numbers, 120 features. Turns out that most machine learning algorithms do worse and worse the more features that we have. So if we're able to reduce the number of features before we supply it to the machine learning algorithm, great. How can we reduce those 120 numbers? How so? By just interpolating the difference between the next and the previous bone. So in most of the bones in the hand from a frame of data, the base of one figure, the base coordinates of one bone are equal to the tip coordinates of the bone behind it towards the palm, right? So there's lots of redundancies that exist in those 120 numbers, and the bulk of the work in deliverable five is gonna be finding those and reducing your, your number of features down from 120 to a much more reasonable number. That's where we're heading over the next two weeks. Sound good? Okay, back to lecture. So uh, perfect timing in terms of course flow. We'll finish up our discussion about design principles, rules of thumb for trying to design interactive systems. And we'll talk uh, in, in lecture six about a particular form of design, which is visual design. How do we design a visualization to communicate how well our KNN algorithm is doing, for example? Okay. So just as a reminder, last time we were working our way through this uh, long, somewhat vague sentence from the reading, which is, what are we trying to do when we're designing interactive systems? We're not just trying to get the function right and debug it and make sure that everything is working. We need to also make sure that our system is easy for the user to use, they like using it, they would prefer our system over another system, and so on. And we took that idea, that intuition, and tried to unpack it into 12 different features or design principles we would like to build into our uh, system. Right? We ended last time by looking at flexibility, style, and conviviality. So let's finish off, uh, let's finish off deliverable five by listing these 12 design principles. In a moment, you're gonna to turn to your neighbor and you're gonna spend two or three minutes brainstorming about different kinds of technologies that are out there at the moment that instantiate those principles well or poorly. Let's start with the first one, visibility. Can you think of some systems that communicate or make visible what they can do in an un uncomplicated manner. They easily communicate some sort of new function to the user. Google search bar. Google search bar, right? What's an example of something that's not visible, that's very opaque? I'm sure you've all had experience using a web page or a piece of technology where it surprises you. PeopleSoft. What's that? PeopleSoft. PeopleSoft, thank you, exactly. That's gonna go in every element in the right hand <laughs> column, right? There's, PeopleSoft can do a lot of things. I don't know how to find those features or extract them. I don't know where the web pages are, the help pages are, to find out what's available in PeopleSoft. Um, speaking of consistency, I'd also like to add PeopleSoft because um, <laughs> across browsers, they don't work the same either. Great example. PeopleSoft looks very different from one browser to the next. Okay, I will leave you to do that. Last one, just as a reminder, we introduced this new concept of affordance last time. This is gonna come up many times in this course. What is an affordance? It's how the user can choose 
it's like an assumption that either you or the user makes that you design around? Uh, it's not an assumption. It's, affordance is an advertisement, right? So it's not so much from the point of view, the way to think about affordances is not from the human observer, it's from the object or the thing that's being viewed. That object is projecting or suggesting or advertising an affordance, a way in which the user can interact with it, right? Last time I showed you those pictures of five very different chairs, they all had extremely different geometries but taken together, they were collectively advertising the same affordance, which is sitability, right? If I was to approach that object, it, I could probably sit on it and it would support my weight, right? That's, that's an affordance. Okay, I think the rest are pretty self-explanatory, so turn to your neighbor, pick one of these, one or a couple at random, and come up with some good or poor examples of technologies that instantiate that principle. of time let's move on um, we could we could spend the rest of today going through all of these I want to just focus on affordances because I think this is the one that's sort of most novel for for most of you what are some examples of technologies that instantiate affordances well or not so well The door with the push bar, right? Does everybody remember the Gary Larson cartoon, School of the Gifted, where he's pushing instead of pulling or vice versa, right? Surprisingly difficult to get door handles and door knobs and bars right to suggest, is it pullable? Is it pushable? Is it both? Right? Seems like an obvious thing. If you look around campus, you can find plenty of doors where that's done well and maybe not so well. What about technology? Physical objects is a good place to start, right? A hammer. A hammer, okay. Okay, a, a hammer does because we're used to hammers, right? I mean, again, Google just kind of wins because there's only two buttons. One that says search, so. 
Exactly, right? It's pretty simple. So everything is hidden from you and the stuff that remains is trying to advertise searchability. A power switch? How so? It's got a little on or off. Sometimes there's an actual label. Sometimes there isn't. So how do you know what's on and what's off? Up or down. Up or down. Lots of buttons in our world these days, right? Buttons and switches and so on. Usually green light is on. Green is on. Blue is off. No light is off. The light on is is on. What are not that great in touchscreens? Uh, just inherently they're banned from destroyers, like always, like always. Oh, okay, touchscreens, right? If you don't even know if it is a touchscreen or not, like have you ever seen someone like over screen and start scratching at it and you don't know if it's a button or not? Absolutely. Touchscreens are difficult, right? Because we don't have the 3D geometry anymore, right? The, the shaft of a hammer, it sometimes has little ribs showing exactly how to grasp the object, buttons, doors. We've got three-dimensional geometry to play with, which humans have a lot of intuition of taking in or inferring 3D geometry and guessing the advertisement but that 3D geometry is making. If you have a two-dimensional glass panel on a touchscreen, what can you do, right? You have to now rely on what's being drawn on the two-dimensional surface. So let's switch now to software. More difficult but not impossible. What are some affordances that exist in software? We mentioned Google already. Uh, uh, like when we're making a website, there's a hyperlink. Okay. And uh, sometimes people uh, just remove the color, so you have the mouse, it do not change color. So okay. that's a bad affordance. Right, so in the old days, blue text with the line underneath it, right? That suggests it's just something very specific. That's in some cases going away, but for us full old folks, that's <laughs> difficult, right? We, we were used to the affordance. Where do I click? I'm looking for the blue underlined text. Uh, mail clients that have an icon that looks like a letter, right? So again, we're going to rely on building affordances by falling back on familiarity and consistency, right? I'm used to files and folders and letters and drop boxes and recycle bins and trash bins, right? All these things suggest things. I'm going to just create icons that represent physical objects. That's a good solution. Let's go one step further. No more physical metaphors. We can't use letters and folders, something that's more abstract. How do you create an abstract affordance? Uh, like uh, when we move the mouse onto an icon, it yep. actually shakes. Aha, yeah. right? So things that shake or vibrate, what is, that, what is it advertising usually? Uh, what does I that can, mean? I, I'm functional. I'm functionable. I can exactly. I'm. Can I'm waving. I'm you. waving at you, the observer. Right? Hey, I can do something for you. It may not be obvious from the, the wobble itself about what it is. It's it's kind of meta, right? It's affording an affordance. You can interact with me, but maybe the shape of the icon suggests. All right. If you click on me, I'm a ma I'm a letter. You'll send me if you click on me or or what have you, right? What about things that don't shake but flash? What is something that's flashing on the screen mean? Like your cursor for typing. Okay, yeah, so you can enter text if the cursor's flashing. I'm trying to get your attention, right? And I'm being a little bit aggressive about it, right? A flash is more aggressive than something that's wobbling, right? Something that's wobbling is saying, I'm trying not to capture too much of your attention, but I think I think there's something that might be relevant to you, right? These are all sort of subtle cues, but we have expectations about what these things mean, even if we're not aware that we do. If you're creating new software, and in the midst of your user looking at their physical hand and saccading to the screen and looking at the virtual hand and making sure they're all lined up, if suddenly in the top right of your Pi game window you start flashing something else, the user is going to look over there and they've lost what they were trying to do. So whatever you were flashing on the screen better be relevant for the user at that moment in time 
and it's going to help them do whatever they're trying to do. Right? Okay. Okay, I think, again, this is a good table to sort of fill out at, at your own pace and get a feel for what these design principles actually move, mean. Let's switch now and talk specifically about visual design. This is a vast topic, and we could spend an entire course talking about this. We're going to just talk about this again from an HCI perspective. We are in the midst of the big data revolution. There is an, exponential, an exponentially growing amount of data from one year to the next. Uh, companies basically just can't hire enough data scientists, data analytics. Everybody in every company is drowning in data and they need people to pull information out of that data, right? When you capture your 120 features from a frame of data, it's just data. It doesn't really mean anything yet until you start to do something with it. How do we take data and present it to an observer to make it actionable? They, there is patterns that they can see in the data. It's information. It communicates some structure in the data that's useful or interesting or entertaining to the observer. Difficult because we have a lot of data. We don't just have a lot of data. We have very different kinds uh, of data, obviously. We have data stored at different time and spatial uh, resolutions, subjective data, objective data. We've got data of doubtful quality. Some data sets you can trust more uh, than others. We have data that represents abstract things like income per capita. And then we have data where there is some physical counterpart out in the world. We have counts of items in an inventory. And most importantly these days, and part of the reason why the amount of data is growing exponentially, is we have metadata, data about data, or data about data about data. So I mentioned some common metadata things here. You capture a frame of data in your, uh, in your deliverable, and you might attach to that date 120 numbers, that data set metadata. It was captured at exactly this point in time, and it was captured from user K. This set of 120 numbers was captured at a different time for that user, right? That's metadata. What are some other examples of important metadata that exists out there in the world? Runtime is a great one, right? So we have processes out there. How long did it take for this thing to, to occur? Okay. Okay. Interesting. Okay. That's a great example. So knowledge is power, right? If we're talking about financial data, sometimes the data itself is useful, stock of a given company, but often the metadata is even more valuable, right? Who captured the data when? How long did it take to pull this data from a server in milliseconds or picoseconds, sometimes that makes all the difference. Um, like film people, yep. a lot of their kind of digital lab, and when they're downloading the data, they want information on like the f-stop and um, aperture information and speed, the FPS, frames per second, and all that kind of yep. stuff, because that helps them. Um, when the editors uh, do digital transfers, they can use that information to have a standardized look for, for a movie. That's a great example. So if we're dealing with movie data or video streaming, what was the physical device that captured that data and what were the settings of that camera or that device, right? Where did the data come from? Data provenance, right? Who captured it? What captured it? When? At how many frames per second? That all, that all matters. And a lot of that has to do with um, the fact that the, you know the chip is like a 14 bearer or CCD um, chip is actually communicating with the lens okay. and transferring digitally that information, which is tra then transferred to the recorded information. 
Exactly, right? So all that, all that matters. Where, how, how is the data captured? Again, we could spend a lot of time talking about this concept. You mentioned the computational story lab, which is a great setup for my next slide here. Probably be helpful if I make this full screen for a moment. Okay, so Computational Story Lab runs here at uh, University of Vermont, and it's headed by two math faculty, Professor uh, Peter Dodds and Chris Danforth. You may have taken a math class with either of them. Years back, uh, they got special access to Twitter data, and they got access to what's known as the garden hose. And the garden hose is 10% of all tweets issued by Twitter uh, per day, every day. There is also the fire hose, which is 100%. And there are only a few institu institutions that have access to the fire hose. And I'll leave you to guess what those institutions are. This is a visualization created by Professor Dodds and Danforth and their students from the garden hose. They took every tweet. They, took, they pulled the words out of that tweet. And they measured the average happiness of a word. How do you measure the happiness of a word? Turns out that there are actually quantitative ways to do this. It turns out that the word triumphant and other words like that are the most happy words in the English language. Words like uh, suicide and murder are the most negative words. Words like the, of, and and, somewhere in between. So for a lot of common words in English, you can actually associate a happiness number with them. Take every tweet from the garden hose, pull out every word from every tweet, measure the happiness score and average over all tweets from that day, plot it on a graph and you get what's now known as the hedonometer and you can go to hedonometer.org and actually play around with this interactive system. So this is a great example, um, obviously, because it's local, but also because it's an attempt to try and communicate a vast amount of information. There is a lot of information in the Twitter garden hose aside from just the tweets themselves, the actual messages inside. There's some obvious patterns here and some less obvious ones that would be very <coughs> difficult to see if you were just looking at the actual tweets from the garden hose rather than visualizing it. What are some of those subtle patterns? What are the things that would have that are clear from this picture, but would have been completely opaque. They would have been invisible if you were just scrolling through all the tweets from the garden hose. Um, I don't know if this is applicable, but um, it, you could tell based on some, what um, maybe some political affiliations that the majority of Twitter um, participants have. You might be able to infer something about the political slant of uh, the people that are tweeting in the garden hose, possibly. Um, if you kind of ignore the outlier and smaller, really low ones, and are looking at the main line, it looks like generally people are tweeting happier on Friday and Saturday than they are on the weekdays. Interesting. Right up top and then Whether people are happier on Friday or Saturday, who knows, but at least they tweet happier words <laughs> on Friday and Saturday, right? Seems in retrospect intuitive, but it would be probably hard to actually see that if you were scrolling through the tweets. That's a great example. What else? What are some other subtle patterns in here? And over time, people's moods change much more radically. Interesting, right? So over time, and you mean over the over years, time, right? So we can actually look over the last decade and ask questions about Twitter as a whole, at least sampled from uh, the fire hose through to the garden hose, right? That there seems to be some oscillations. Now, what is causing those very slow oscillations? That is not immediately obvious. It's a complicated story, and we're not gonna discuss that here, but the moment you plot this, it's there. Is it an artifact of the data? Is it an artifact of the garden hose? Is it an artifact of the way in which we assign these happiness numbers to words? Is it something real that's going on in the population that's being evidenced by these tweets? That's one of the things that the Computational Story Lab investigates. But for our purposes, we're focusing on step one, which is sitting down and thinking about how to plot this information that's extracted from the tweets. One could 
I could give you the garden hose and you could think up a very different kind of visualization that presents some of this underlying structure in a very different way. Why did members of the computational story lab choose this particular way to visualize this very complicated data set compared to another way? That's what we're thinking about in our discussion about visual design. Okay, so um, obviously this is a pretty tricky thing to do because usually um, we're dealing with very large and very complicated data sets. So our first instinct is let's throw away some data. We have four features for each of our 75 training flowers. Can't draw in four dimensions, so let's throw away two of the four features. Right? We've literally lost half of our data set. A useful thing to do for educational purposes so that we can wrap our minds around how KNN works but not a good thing to do when we actually want to use KNN. Then we better make sure to give it all four of the features, assuming that all four are useful. We can try and systematize the data. If we're collecting uh, huge amounts of data, for example, Twitter data, depending on the settings on our users' phones, some of these tweets have metadata associated with them such as where and when the tweet was issued, and some of the tweets in this do not, right? At least all the, all the tweets that are plotted here must have had timestamps associated with them because we're plotting the, this data as a function of time on the horizontal axis. Didn't you just say that uh, machine learning algorithms, like with the less parameters they have, are more accurate and the more, the greater in accuracy they have, so? Okay, so that's a great question. So. Uh, Back to machine learning for a moment. We want to try and give them as few features as possible. If they have too many features, they often don't work very well. We want to reduce things to as few features as possible. But like in visual design, we don't want to go too far. We don't want to throw out information. We want to reduce the number of features without reducing the amount of information. In the case of your leap motion uh, NumPy array, you have 120 numbers, 20, 120 data points in that set, that's data, but the amount of information in there, you can actually reduce the amount of data by throwing away some of the redundant data and not throwing away any of the information, right? Bases and tips of neighboring bones overlap, that's redundant data. We can reduce the number of features, but not throw away information. Same idea here. We might have a lot of raw data. There might be ways to reduce some of that data without throwing away the information. Again, in some cases, that's a lot easier said than done. Okay. We could give up on simplification and systematization and just try and show everything, but that doesn't work because we very quickly overwhelm the user. Somebody was mentioning uh, trying to draw KNN and visualize KNN working with different values of K. We could try that and show all the 75 test points for a, a large number of settings of K and create a whole bunch of plots and then show that to a user and ask them, given this visualization, which value of K is a good value of K. <coughs> Depending on how you create the visualization, you may overwhelm them and they say, I have no idea. All I see is a wash of points and colors and circles and so on. I can't tell, right? How do we create a simple enough visualization that the observer can extract information from that visualization, like what is a good value of K, without overwhelming them? Very difficult thing to do. Comment? I was going to say you could remove all of the test data and just only show the ones that were wrong so you get it countable. Exactly. So uh, remember when we saw the little GIF last time of the, the spreadsheet with wrestlers in it, right? We can often remove information rather than adding it, right? So what is all the information in here that the user doesn't need to see? They probably don't need to know the actual values of the two features. So one of the black arts of visual design is thinking intelligently about what to remove, not what to add. That's a great, that's a great point. As we've already mentioned several times already, we can provide metaphors. So hopefully we can communicate in the metaphor by relying on things that are familiar to the observer. So the user, if we get the metaphor right, they can transfer their intuitions about the physical world or the social world to the conceptual world. 
How would you visualize the spread of AIDS around the world? I give you health and wealth data from Gapminder and ask you to create a specific visualization of the spread of an infectious disease globally. How might you approach that? A map. We're going to st obviously start with a map, right? Most people, that's your first guess. Again, because that's what we're familiar with, right? You could show the spread of an infectious disease around the world without a map. There may be clever ways to do it, but it's, it's kind of strange, right, to the observer. Why, why are we not seeing this spreading across a map of the globe? How do we visualize the spread of an idea around the globe, right? So now we're moving into something that's a little bit more abstract. Does a map still make sense? Maybe. Depends on what idea we're talking about, right? These days, ideas tend to spread not really along roads and with airplanes and cars. They spread along, or, uh, along the internet, right? They're, they spread along lines in a network, and that network doesn't really have a good one-to-one -one <coughs> correspondence with a map of the globe. So do we go with the visualization of the spread of an idea through a social network or the internet or actually impose it onto a map? Who knows, right? It, again, it depends on the idea we're talking about. Okay. However, metaphors are tricky because not everyone might get the metaphor, right? We talked about exclusion quite a bit already. Are we relying on a metaphor that everybody understands? If we're trying to communicate an idea to young children, do they know how to read a map of the globe? Maybe yes, maybe no. Who, who is the observer of this visualization? Okay. So uh, we've got five minutes left. So uh, what we're going to do is just watch the first five minutes of a TED Talk. This is one of the very first TED Talks. And this particular TED Talk is one of the key factors in what made TED so famous. We're going to watch uh, a talk by Hans Rosling, who is the creator of Gapminder. And he's going to introduce Gapminder in this talk. The video is 20 minutes long, so we'll watch the first five minutes and the remaining 15 minutes next time. As you watch the video, I want you to write down uh, various observations from this video. You're going to be watching this video from the point of view of an HCI designer. He's going to be describing Gapminder, which has already been designed. But he's, there are going to be many features of Gapminder that Hans Rosling is going to animate or demonstrate in his TED Talk. And I want you to note down what those different features are and how do they relate to what we've talked about so far about visual design. He's going to talk about some abstract and not so abstract concepts. A lot of uh, wealth data like GNP is sort of abstract. It doesn't have a physical counterpart uh, in the world. How does he concretize those abstract ideas? How does, they, how does he quote unquote bring them to life? What visual features does he use to do that? In some cases, it's a static image. In some cases, it's an animation. What are the visual constructs that are used? How does he make use of size, shape, color, height, width, coordinate systems, uh, distances, and so on? And as he presents, how does the crowd react to those demonstrations? How much of the visualization does he have to verbally describe to his audience, and how much does the audience figure out for themselves? Sound good? OK. And I've somehow lost my sound. Um, it's much bigger the difference than the It's 9.43. Instead of spending the remaining two minutes fidgeting with audiovisual, we will start with Hans Rosling on Thursday. You have a quiz due tonight. You're working on Deliverable 4. I'll see you Thursday morning. Thank you. <laughs>